Hello everyone, this is Matt Wilhelm from Invasive Species Action Network in Livingston, Montana. I'd like to thank you all today for joining me for this discussion about keystone species. Keystone species are very unique because they're crucial to the functioning of ecosystems. They affect entire communities of birds, plants, animals, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. Without keystone species, ecosystems would totally change or disappear altogether. If a keystone species were to disappear, no other organism could take its place or be a substitute within that ecosystem to fill its very specific role. An ecosystem is where all living things are interacting within each other within a given area. A keystone species is a life form or organism that affects the entire community of plants and animals. And like I said earlier, if it were to be removed, the ecosystem would change dramatically. Now, we're going to use Yellowstone National Park today as our uh, focus area for keystone species. And the reason we're going to do that is, is because Yellowstone Park is among one of the most intact ecosystems in North America. Because this ecosystem in Yellowstone National Park is so complete, it helps us to understand what keystone species are, the specific role that they play, and their impact on the entire ecosystem. In ecosystems, all species rely on one another, and each organism has its own specific role to play. Now, some of those specific roles that they have to play could be as a producer, a consumer, or a decomposer. The picture on the left is a picture of a grassland or a prairie that's full of grasses. Grasses are considered producers, and producers make their own energy, their own food from sunlight. Consumers, like the bobcat pictured below, are key to ecosystems because they prey on other consumers and they also eat producers. A decomposer, like the fungus on the tree pictured on the right, decomposers are very crucial to ecosystems because they're usually bacteria or fungus or invertebrates that break down dead animal matter, they break down dead plants, and they also break down animal waste. So within an ecosystem, you've got producers, consumers, and decomposers all working within that ecosystem to help the ecosystem thrive and be healthy. Now let's talk about the gray wolf. The gray wolf is probably the most important keystone species in Yellowstone National Park. It is essential for the proper functioning of that entire ecosystem. Gray wolves packs average six to eight members in size. A typical pack consists of an alpha male, an alpha female, and their offspring. They are highly structured, complex social groups. The alpha pair which are the male and the female, are the only ones who mate within the pack. Sometimes two-year-olds will leave the pack, branch out, and form their own packs. A wolf pack will eat up to 800 pounds of meat in a month, and that 800 pounds would constitute about two to three elk per month. The gray wolf in Yellowstone Park was reintroduced in 1995. They went extinct in 1920 uh, because they were poisoned, uh, they were trapped, they were hunted uh, to extinction. The importance of wolves as an apex predator in Yellowstone National Park is that they control elk populations. When the wolves were removed in 1920, elk populations exploded in Yellowstone National Park. 
The elk overgrazed the grasslands and the riverbanks, and this caused what is called a trophic cascade within that ecosystem. The picture on the left are of stunted aspen trees. This happens quite often in an overgrazed area, uh, and it could be as an example of where the elk were overgrazing the grasslands of Yellowstone National Park. A trophic cascade is defined as changes within an ecosystem due to the addition or the removal of a top predator. With the removal of the Yellowstone wolves within that particular ecosystem, the elk overgrazed the landscape. They overgrazed the grasslands, the prairies, and the riverbanks. Now, when they overgrazed the riverbanks, this was of a particular uh, uh, harm to the beavers because beavers are also a keystone species. And when the elk overgrazed the aspen, the cottonwood, and the willow, it took away the food source for the beavers. And beavers create wetlands. And we'll talk way more about the beavers and their connection to the ecosystem later as an apex animal. This picture kind of shows what a trophic cascade is. On the left, it shows the presence of wolves. And when wolves are present, you have a reasonable population of elk. And because you have a reasonable population of elk, you have a healthy forest and a healthy grassland. The picture on the right shows us when you do not have wolves, you have an overabundance or an overpopulation of elk. And because of that overpopulation, you have an unhealthy grassland and you have unhealthy forests. So the wolves were reintroduced in 1995. When this happened, the elk populations came down and the ecosystem returned to health. There was a change in elk behavior. Uh, there, were, there was less grazing uh, out in open grasslands because the wolves were hunting them and the vegetation regrew. Let's talk about elk a little bit. Elk are key to the ecosystem of Yellowstone National Park and many ecosystems outside of Yellowstone National Park because they're a primary food source for many other animals. Uh, many carnivores, including wolves, bears, mountain lions, um, coyotes, and then also when their carcasses are stripped clean of protein and meat, uh, mice feed on their bones, porcupine uh, feed on their antlers uh, to get nutrients and vitamins and minerals. Elk have always been a plains animal or grasslands animal. And with the presence of an apex predator like the wolf, those elk populations on those prairie glass, grasslands were kept in check. Now, without the wolves, like I mentioned earlier, without that apex predator, those populations exploded and those grasslands got, uh, came into a lot of stress and their quality was decreased. Elk are the most abundant large animals found in Yellowstone National Park. And there has been a continuous presence of elk for over a thousand years within Yellowstone. So without that apex predator, that led to big problems. The elk became accustomed to grazing in the open without any fear, without danger of being preyed upon by an apex predator. Now, sure, there were wolves and there, or I'm sorry, there were bears and there were coyotes, but not at the populations needed to, to take uh, enough elk out of the ecosystem. They overgrazed those upland prairies and they impacted the beaver populations, which in, uh, affected wetlands. So now we've been talking about those beavers for a little bit in previous slides. Let's talk about the beaver now. Little factoids about the beaver. They're the largest rodent species in North America. They eat the leaves <clears throat> and the bark and the roots of willow trees, aspen trees, and cottonwood trees. They live in large family groups and they mate for life. Beavers build dams out of sticks, logs, leaves, and twigs, and they 
uh, cement all of that wood, uh, woody material with mud. This creates a dam and they dam up small creeks and small rivers. And when they dam, when they put a beaver dam up, that creates a backwater, a wetland. Some people call it a beaver pond. These little mini wetlands are very attractive to other animals. It is a draw to deer and elk, uh, mice, skunks, badger, pretty much all animals love wetlands because of the different types of plants they produce, the different types of insects that they produce. Uh, it provides a safe place for them to raise their young because wetlands often have a lot of plants uh, and, and trees growing around them. So the beaver in that aspect is very important as an apex animal, or I'm sorry, as a keystone species because it creates wetlands that allow other animals, insects, amphibians, birds to thrive in. 85% of all American animal species rely on wetlands. And this picture on the left is an example of a beaver dam. This this particular beaver dammed up a small creek and created a mini wetland where frogs can survive, where you have a uh, high uh, insect, aquatic insect population. It's a draw for animals to come and drink to, uh, drink at. And when you bring all these animals in, it brings in predators and it helps to create a very healthy ecosystem. Now let's talk about Yellowstone cutthroat trout for a moment. Yellowstone cutthroat trout are considered a keystone species around the Yellowstone Lake area in Yellowstone National Park. There are 14 subspecies of Yellowstone cutthroat trout in the West. The Yellowstone cutthroat trout is native only to the Yellowstone River ecosystem, which, include, which includes Yellowstone Lake. The Yellowstone cutthroat trout is also in the Snake River drainage that flows west toward the Pacific Ocean. Yellowstone cutthroat trout are considered keystone species because they are a food source for many, many, many different types of animals and birds. Their impact as a keystone species in particular on ospreys and eagles is profound. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So cutthroat trout, like I'd mentioned, are a keystone species in Yellowstone, in the Yellowstone Lake system. Um, they're an important food source for 16 different animal species. Uh, one that I'm going to talk about right now are grizzly bears. Uh, when grizzly bears come out of the den, one of the first things they feed on are dead animals from the wintertime. Now, then, after the dead animals are eaten, the winter has killed, they start to feed on grasses and roots. Uh, they also prey on young bison and they prey on young elk. And about the same time, that is when the cutthroat trout in Yellowstone Lake are migrating up into shallow tributaries, just like the picture on the left shows here. When those cutthroat trout migrate into shallow tributaries, they're an easy meal for pretty much any carnivore, uh, like bears, bobcat, wolf, uh, mountain lion, black bear, wolverine, any meat-eating uh, otters, any, any meat-eating uh, uh, animal will enjoy an easy fish dinner out of a shallow creek when these cutthroat trout come up to spawn. So the population of Yellowstone cutthroat trout went into steady decline starting in about 1980, and the decrease was mainly due to the introduction of non-native lake trout. They think that these lake trout were illegally introduced by what's called bucket biology. Bucket biology is when people, humans, uh, will uh, will get a will catch a bunch of fish like lake trout, <clears throat> put them in a bucket, and transport them to another water body like Yellowstone Lake and dump them in where they do not belong. Whirling disease, which is an aquatic invasive species parasite, also had huge impacts on cutthroat trout populations. Whirling disease killed thousands and thousands of, of Yellowstone uh, cutthroat trout over the years. And like I said on the previous slide, you can see this picture of Yellowstone Lake and you can see all of the tributaries that feed into the, into the lake. One creek I'd like to talk about specifically is Clear Creek 
kind of right here it comes in on, on the east side of Yellowstone Lake Clear Creek was one of the is one of the main spawning tributaries for the Yellowstone cutthroat in Yellowstone Lake in 1978 they had a peak population of spawning cutthroat of over 70,000 because of the introduction of lake trout and because of the introduction of whirling disease that number went down to 538 in 2007. Because Yellowstone cutthroat trout are a keystone species, that decline in cutthroat trout populations had major impacts on ospreys, eagles, and other meat-eating animals. The osprey population around Yellowstone Lake plummeted until there was only three or four nesting pair around Yellowstone Lake because there just wasn't enough Yellowstone cutthroat trout for them to eat because the lake trout had such huge impacts on their populations, as did um, the whirling disease parasite. Let's talk about non-native fish. Now, we talked about the lake trout in Yellowstone Lake. Let's talk about something else now. Let's talk about rainbow trout. Rainbow trout are non-native to the Yellowstone Park ecosystem. All right, and what happens is, is that the problem that rainbow trout cause is that they will spawn with a cutthroat. And when a rainbow trout spawns with a cutthroat trout, you get a crossbreed or a hybrid. Those hybrids are not genetically pure cutthroat. They're half rainbow, half cutthroat. And those cut bows, those hybrids can reproduce. So when a cut bow reproduces with the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, that also knocks out the pure genetic strain of Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Another problem some non-native trout is the brook trout. Brook trout were introduced uh, to the West a little over 100 years ago, and brook trout are, uh, can outcompete cutthroat trout in their native habitat. All right? Now, because of non-native introduced fish, uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout population plunged 90% when it was once as high as 4 million fish in the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem. Management of these non-native fish species has been ongoing uh, for several years by the Park Service. Um, and the removal process in Yellowstone Lake is, is that lake trout must be kept or killed. If you catch a lake trout in Yellowstone Lake, you may not release it. You have to, you have to keep it or kill it. The Park Service has a very aggressive netting program where they net the lake trout and they remove the lake trout. Another thing that they do is that they use satellite tracking uh, to track, to find out where the spawning beds of the lake trout are. They take the netted lake trout and they chop it up into small little pieces and they scatter all of the chopped up lake trout down onto the spawning beds. And what that does is it, it suffocates the eggs. It takes up all the oxygen and it draws in bacteria that impact the spawning beds. Over 300,000 lake trout are removed annually from Yellowstone Lake. Now, please keep in mind, this rule of removal of lake trout is only for Yellowstone Lake. For other lakes in Yellowstone National Parks and other lakes around the West, there are other management rules. Please keep in mind, this is only specific to Yellowstone National Park. There are also catch and kill restrictions on non-native fish in other rivers in Yellowstone National Park, like uh, Slough Creek, Soda Butte Creek, the Lamar River, the Yellowstone River, the Gardner River. Now, if you catch a non-native uh, rainbow or a brown trout or a brook trout, in some rivers in Yellowstone National Park, you are required to keep or kill those fish. So please, before you go fishing in Yellowstone National Park, read your fishing regulations and know the rules. Another thing that's created are fish barriers. These are concrete barriers that uh, fishing game agencies put up. They're usually six to eight feet tall. Concrete barrier when, uh, that keeps non-native fish from moving into an area where there are genetically pure cutthroat trout. These fish barriers are located throughout Yellowstone National Park on some creeks and outside of Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming and Montana. Um, and they're very effective of keeping uh, genetically pure cutthroat populations healthy from the invasion of non-native fish. The outlook is very positive right now for the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. The arrow is trending up. 
We're not back to where we were before, but because of these management techniques, uh, things are getting better and better every day for the cutthroat. So in conclusion, we'd just like to talk about uh, a few things. Uh, to recap, keystone species are essential to ecosystem health. The presence or absence of a few species has profound impacts on entire ecosystems. The wolf reintroduction was key to the entire ecosystem health of Yellowstone National Park because they were an apex predator and helped to keep the elk populations at a healthy level. Through management of the Park Service uh, and other agencies, uh, the management of lake trout and other non-native fish, the Yellowstone cutthroat trout are starting to come back. So now it's time for Creativity Corner. Uh, we invite you to visit these fun extensions and learn more about keystone species. So please click on the link below. The entire staff of Invasive Species Action Network would like to thank you for viewing this lesson today on keystone species. Invasive Species Action Network is concerned with the human-caused spread of invasive species. To limit invasive species spread, we ask that you clean, drain, and dry your outdoor gear, watercraft, fishing gear after every single use as to not spread aquatic invasive species from water body to water body. To learn more about aquatic invasive species, please visit www stopais.org. Also at this website are other uh, great lessons where you can learn more about your watersheds. So thank you very much and have a great day.